make sure this is all working with the power of technology. Um, can people see my shared screen? Because I sort of, as I share it, it goes blank on the other one. Yes, I can. Yes, yes, we can. Oh, excellent. So let me just move some windows around so I've got some, see what's going on. Okay, well, <clears throat> yeah, thanks again so much for having me. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, talk to you today. Um, I believe, so there's a question already about this meeting going to be recorded, and I believe it is being recorded. Yes, we are recording it. Uh, okay, excellent. So that is being recorded. Um, yes, yeah, stick your questions in the chat as we go. Um, I can't promise I'll be able to check them exactly as, as we're going through the presentation. But yeah, more than happy to uh, take any feedback, to get any questions. Um, yeah, this is I'm pretty informal. Uh, uh, so yeah, we'll we'll work it out as we go along. So, I yeah. think the option to raise uh, raise your hand on Zoom or something does it uh, show? Uh, okay, if if anybody has any questions, you can just uh, you know take a turn and asking Julian. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Julian Wood. I'm a senior developer advocate here at uh, AWS. And I've got a cool job, actually. I work with builders and developers to help them understand how best to build serverless applications, as well as being their voices internally to make sure that we are, in fact, building mm -hmm. the best serverless products and features. Uh, before this, I was an infrastructure engineer and architect for many uh, for many years, and I've worked in sort of large enterprises in, in finance and broadcasting and things like that. And I've been using and talking about serverless for a number of years, and really helping the world fall in love with serverless, just as I have. And now I'm super lucky I get to do this at AWS. The twin girls who super keep me busy, particularly in lockdown with homeschooling. Um, yeah, but they're awesome. Uh, with an amazing wife with many superpowers who, who helps us all. And yeah, I'm originally from Cape Town, South Africa. And even though we're talking serverless, interestingly, EC2 was originally developed in Cape Town, South Africa. So um, we've come through an arc of, of where, thing, where, where things have come. So yeah, please feel free to contact me anytime with your serverless questions, whether you have questions from today or anything uh, general around serverless uh, development. And uh, there's my yeah, Twitter handle and email. I'd be happy to hear from you. So we're going to basically cover three things today. <clears throat> Primarily, I'm going to talk about the basics of event-driven architectures, uh, some best practices for adopting the paradigm yourself. I'll then give you an introduction to Amazon Event Bridge, which is a new serverless event bus from AWS. And we'll you know, take a look at how that service works and how it fits into some of the concepts I covered in the first uh, selection. And then we'll go through some common use cases uh, of EventBridge for event-driven architectures. And we'll finally also go and talk about how, your app, how you can integrate your application with some interesting third-party providers, which are built into um, EventBridge, and I'll show you uh, a demo on this. I do have some demos. I'm also happy to take questions, as I said. So yeah, let's get, let's get started. So uh, I want to talk, about, uh, talk about a few challenges, first of all, in software development today. Um, first, have you noticed how monoliths are everywhere? You know, they keep trying to break these down and net, they seem to also keep uh, reappearing. And that's not always necessarily <clears throat> a bad thing. You may have seen a, a slide like this before. This isn't a talk about breaking down the monolith. Uh, you know, monoliths often get a bad rep, but you know, they're actually easy to build and to reason about. Everything's in one place. And they often just connect to one asset compliant database. So it's really simple to understand. But as soon as you start distributing things around your application with distributed systems and heading to microservices, this becomes far more complex. And the problem is that monoliths don't scale, and that's both in terms of throughput and even team size. You know, the more developers that need to work on a monolith, just makes it more difficult for people to uh, coordinate. If you know, you have dozens, hundreds of engineers trying to build features in parallel, you really need to start moving towards uh, a microservices model. But monoliths keep showing up because they're easy to they're easier to get going. Now, this isn't a session itself from breaking a monolith, so I don't want to spend too much time here, but I think it's important to recognize that 
all these cool new architectural paradigms, including event-driven architectures, are really in service to these fundamental goals. We want to enable teams within larger organizations to be able to build valuable features for their customers and to do it in a way that's reliable and resilient and scalable. And we want them to be able to deliver all of these things quickly. So really the goal of this uh, talk is to show how you can use event-driven architectures. Um, so there's also a challenge with uh, distributed systems. And we'll talk about some of the challenges associated with building these distributed systems, starting with um, something called coupling. Now, one of the big benefits that's often uh, cited is that microservices are decoupled or loosely coupled. But um, you know, it's important to think that uh, any time that you have two systems talking to each other, there is some degree of coupling happening there. And as time goes on, it lands up being very easy, even when you have split something off, it's very easy to then recouple these application components together. And that starts heading you back towards the monolith away from microservices. And you know, that means you need to start to think about the long-term ramifications of that for the health of your system. So this is a simple example. It's a pretty standard synchronous API. You know, many developers, myself included, have all written plenty of these. And you know, the client comes in and says, hey, I want to make an order. The order, sends, order service sends the request and sends it then downstream to, uh, uh, to an invoice service. If it's successful, the invoice service then responds back with a 201 success message to the order service, which then sends the 201 uh, success message back to the um, client message. So, sorry, I've just got to ask, do you need me to admit some members? Am I, the, am I holding up people who are stuck? Yeah, because you're the host now. Oh dear, we can't multiple host this. Okay, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be crazy and admit all. So yeah. yeah, thanks. Sorry thanks. for the pause. If um, yeah, if it happens again, let me know. <laughs> I'll hopefully get the, get the message. So yeah, the uh, synchronous API, uh, you have the, uh, the order service to the invoice service, reports back to the order service, reports back to the client. That's simple and that does sort of all work. Now, this looks fine when you've got a simple system like this. Now, it does look decoupled. It's two uh, separate systems, order service and an invoice system. There's no real monolith there. But what happens is that over time, more systems get uh, integrated. We add more services that integrate with the audio service. Um, and it just makes, makes uh, microservices more useful. So here we've got uh, an order service that needs to talk to an invoice service and then a fulfillment service and then a forecasting service. So um, as your application starts to uh, expand, the order service has more responsibilities and more complexity. Uh, the order service must you know, understand the retry semantics for each service. Uh, maybe it has to bundle an SDK for each. Um, if each downstream service has its own API, the order service is responsible then for talking to each of them. And you know, in this, uh, and any backward incompatible changes to the APIs, the order service, they uh, then the order service team rather, is responsible to update that service. And so, you know, what happens is, over long term, more and more systems out there that need data from the order service. And in this model, those teams are blocked by the order service team to implement anything that's new, and they can't operate independently as they once should. Now. Unnecessary friction in the process is caused due to the integration cost of hooking all these services together. So this basically slows down our development process. And uh, not just that, uh, this also decoupling uh, is gone and dependencies are much more fragile. And again, as a whole system, it starts to look a bit more monolithic. It's a common pattern <clears throat> system starting in a decoupled way, trained back to becoming monolithic. In this example, the order service, even though it's a separate subservice, it's very tightly bound to all these other kinds of services. And you know, failure, rec uh, failure recovery looks complicated for this. You've got a, the order service has to manage failure for all these different kinds of things. So what can we do about it? Well, there's also a second issue before I get onto that, is as APIs develop more complex workflow, workflow it can be difficult to make sure each service has the right state. So uh, to make sure that the, the different services can, can understand what's going on and working out what's happening in your system. Let's see if I can explain. 
So here's the same e-commerce application with some additional downstream services such as uh, fulfillment and shipping. In uh, Happy Path, everything works as expected. The order service uh, triggers invoicing, uh, payment systems, and updates forecasting and invoices. Once a payment clears, this triggers the fulfillment and the packing of the order into, uh, onto the shipping service. And now we inform the shipping service to then request some tracking information. Um, but what if the fulfillment center cannot find the product because, I don't know, maybe they are out of stock? A fulfillment uh, service might have to now alert the invoice service and then uh, reverse the payment or uh, click or issue maybe a refund. And then the shipping service might have already been triggered, so that could be another message to fix that. And forecasting could be broken or wrong uh, for some reason because your uh, stock is out of whack and you need to uh, know what you're going to be ordering over the next week. Or, you know, maybe they will just be able to um, accept an adjustment directly. And, you know, this remediation workflow is all just affects one of the many um, potential unhappy parts. So let's think. Here's another thing that happens more often. Imagine your team works on the payment service, but you weren't told that another service, a reward service, was added. This can easily happen as you have your API and people can come and uh, hit your API and developers are excited, your business is excited, they want to add more functionality, quite rightly. And so maybe the reward service didn't uh, find things out originally from, from the order service. So back into the example, what now happens when the fulfillment service errors? Well, the fulfillment service maybe orchestrates all the other services. Your payments team gets a message and you, yep, you can undo your payment, but you don't know who's responsible for the retries and the error logic. And so this whole spaghetti junction uh, turns out that the end result is that the reward service never really finds out what else is going on in the rest of the application. So the reward service thought they were integrated correctly with the order service, but a cancelled order results in a reward for a customer account, which they, which they didn't expect. And also what happens if the reward service changes vendors and maybe has a new API, you know, did the team even know about that? The old service is pinging the new service to try and keep it in sync. Ultimately, it's, you know, it's really hard to coordinate these orchestrations and workflows as systems become more complex and services are added. And here's one more issue. Let's talk about availability within these systems. Back to our ordering system, where your team is managing payments, there are a number of potential problems. There could, for example, be a performance mismatch. If it takes longer to process payments than accept the orders, so in busy periods, your slower performance is holding up the order service and customers, the customer experience is they are getting delays. In asynchronous APIs, putting a fast service in front of a slow one really leads to a whole world of pain. And think of an outage. If the payment service goes down, the order service also goes down. And the availability numbers for the total service are just way worse because these systems are uh, independent. A downstream failure appears as a total failure to the end user. So how can events help with these three challenges? And this is something we see all with all distributed systems. In the simplest terms, an event is a signal that a system state has changed. It's often represented as JSON, and it's some set of facts about the change uh, and potentially the new state. So the attributes of an event may be, uh, which you've got to know what the attributes of an event are. And events are, are facts. They are immutable. It's not something that changes over time. A new event will be created for a change in state. And an event is observable, we're going to what that means a little bit later, and temporal. And that means it's sort of a time-based thing. And events happen in the flow, what happens with events happens in the flow of, of a time-based thing. So in order to understand how events are going to help us serve this one, uh, let's talk about another important property of events, which is that they are asynchronous rather than synchronous. In a synchronous example, like uh, we have here, the client makes a request to service A, service A turns around and then calls service B. But then the service sits around waiting to, service A sits around waiting for service B to finish whatever it's doing before it continue and eventually respond to the client. 
in an asynchronous model, there's no response path. <clears throat> the service surfaces the event and then immediately moves forward. So in this example, you can see that the client makes a request to service A. Service A says, yep, yeah, I've got your request. It sends back to the client and the client can carry on processing. And then service A then goes on to send that request off to service B to do something in the background. And you know, this is really useful in a case where you don't need to have this close coupling and you don't have to have this explicit coupling between the request and the response channels for multiple services. And yeah, we're really interested in the observable nature of events. What does that mean? What does it mean that events are observable, not directed? Well, in a command model, which is a way to think about uh, events being directed, each command is, ex uh, is issued to a explicit uh, specified recipient. You know, please go and create an order. Okay, here it is. Please go and do this. Uh, you know, an API call will say, do something specific. This is, uh, this is what happens. But events on the other side are merely observable by other systems. So for example, event may be, ah, oh, customer X just ordered a widget. And then other people within or systems within the organization will go, ah, oh, that's interesting that the customer ordered a widget. What I'll do is I'll go and add that to the sales report. And then another system does say, oh, you know what, I'll go and send an invoice. And you can see here in this example, two other people within the system actually don't need to do anything. So instead of uh, directed commands where you needed to go say, ah, oh, go add to the sales report, go add an invoice, go add something to the shipping kind of thing, a, um, a event-driven model observable means it's in a way slightly more reactive to what's happening rather than directed. And this also, the benefit is, is that the event producers don't need to have any knowledge who's listening to those events. Um, and this keeps them quite simple to understand and reason about, and also allows other services to consume the events without needing any upstream, upstream changes. So um, how do we actually change this implementation? How do we pass information from the order service to all these downstream systems without actually calling them directly? Julian, I think uh, Juan has a question. Yes, yeah, certainly, Juan. Hi, Juan, how does MQTT relate to event-driven architecture? Uh, is that protocol SDH typical to use? Um, I'm trying to think of a good way to explain MQTT relative to event-driven architectures. Um, I would think MQTT is more related to queues and passing messages, um, <clears throat> but they certainly are linked. I've got some information a bit later which will compare um, uh, event bridge, which we're going to be talking about, to some other products like um, SNS and Kinesis and SQS, and you know MQTT will be also, uh, you, if, you, if you know MQTT, you'll be able to understand and, and correlate that kind of stuff. So hopefully I'll be able to cover that, uh, cover that, cover that a little bit later. Um, Johan's just also got a question, where will the recording be shared? I presume, Anas, you'll, 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 let, you'll let everybody know afterwards where the recording will be. Yes, yes, of course, we'll, uh, we'll find a channel to share it, maybe Twitch. Okay, uh, Johan, also another thing, I actually did a, a webinar recently which I compared all of the different um, streams, topics, queues, and events. And yeah, there are lots of different products, lots of different ways to pass messages between applications. Um, what I'll do is I will find the, the YouTube uh, link for that and then I'll, I'll plunk that in the, in the chat just towards the end. And that is literally a whole 45 minutes, literally on dissecting all the different, uh, all the different ways you can pass messages between applications and the pros and cons um, between more. <clears throat> so yeah, I will get to that. So uh, where was I? Because I clicked on something and uh, yeah, so we're talking about how can we change the implementation and you know, I was going to, I was saying that um, we needed an event bus and, you know, an event bus provides an endpoint where uh, an event producer can just send events and then the router managers directing and filtering those events to the appropriate downstream consumers and then consumers can get the events only they care about reliably without the producers while the producers remaining decoupled and they don't have to know uh, about each other explicitly and be too tightly bound. So now our architecture looks a bit like this. Uh, the order service sends events onto the event bus rather than directly to the individual services. And then the event bus is configured with rules that determine which downstream system gets the event. Now, some of those targets only care about certain events 
and others maybe want all of them. And so you can see here, as events go through the system, um, they will be fired off to different uh, targets. And I mean, either way, the, the event bus, which we better think of as an event router, now takes on that complexity of ensuring that these events get propagated appropriately to each downstream service. So back in our example with an event bus decoupling the architecture, it looks uh, similar. But if uh, fulfillment maybe has an error, they then can raise another event, and that can be uh, an error event. And that, uh, sorry, I've jumped over, that can raise an error event, and this can be a new event that can be caught by all the other services that may be listening, and then they can go and take action accordingly. So think of a fulfillment has an error, creates a new event, and then any other system that needs to be uh, updated with the event state within the fulfillment service can go off and do uh, more kind of stuff. And uh, in the exa other example, where you know a reward service was added, where we had the complexity before, for another team to consume some order services, they just need to add a new rule to the bus. No need to wait on the order service team to make an update for them. And this is really uh, super, super helpful because service teams can act more independently and they can move uh, faster with this decoupling. So if you can see the events with Amazon Event Bridge, your services can both produce messages onto the bus and they can also consume just the messages they need from the bus. The services don't need to know about each other. All they need to know is uh, just about the bus. But that's only part of the thing we're talking about. As your applications uh, expand to include other systems beyond your immediate control, you may need to pass information to and from these uh, external systems. And since you don't know the code, it can be hard to get that information. So look at this example. Uh, we've got a uh, SaaS provider on the left and your systems on the right. And you have some data that's maybe held within a SaaS provider or some workflow that's within the SaaS provider. And you want to couple that SaaS provider to your, um, <clears throat> you would uh, want to couple your SaaS provider to your internal systems. How can you, what are the options to do that? So just a question from Christopher, why would you mention pitfalls regarding um, distributed systems? Um, the pitfalls are, well, pitfalls of distributed systems are, they give you a lot of flexibility, but anytime you distribute, you have a distributed system, there's more coordination. So um, with that coordination, uh, you know, that takes time and effort, and there's uh, issues with keeping things in sync, and there are issues with making sure that everything is correctly coordinated. Hence, products like uh, Amazon EventBridge and many, uh, you know, a number of other, uh, other products to help with that. So the distributed systems really help for scalability and for um, interoperability. But of course, there are some there there are some caveats with that. If you could write everything in a single monolith and that could scale forever, you you'd probably be fine. But you know, you you've got a good business, you've got lots more throughput coming into your application, and so being able to distribute things out makes things uh, make things a lot more scalable. So hopefully that Christopher that answers your your question. Thank you for that. Um, so. We're talking about different ways that we can maybe get uh, data from a third party into our application. Now, one of the options is obviously polling. You could have a Lambda function or something running even on an EC2 uh, service that maybe um, queries every minute. In this example, we've got a polar Lambda function with a, uh, a timer that <coughs> goes on it. And you know that can then poll the third party API. And, you know, this is good enough if the data payload isn't too large. Um, this is, you know, it's the last resort option. You first of all doing, um, you first of all doing unnecessary load on the API. Uh, you know, if you're only polling every 60 seconds, that means uh, it's an average of every 30 seconds of stale data, and you've got no way to manage. Uh, you, you have to manage the polling service. It's uh, something that needs to keep running. Uh, if you don't have a lot of data, your poll is just going to be wasting time and doing things like that. So, you know, it's a, it works, but it's a, a bit of a clunky system. So webhooks is a much better option. You know, this has been around for a long time and you basically provide your SaaS provider with an HTTP endpoint within your service. And then the third party provider can do a post or a get when new info is, information, uh, is available. 
And maybe you have a custom authorizer to validate the calls, so you have some security with that, and other data is a bit closer to real time. As soon as something happens in your third party provider, they can do the post or the get into your account, and you can send that kind of, uh, get that information within, get that data within your account to do what you need to do. So, you know, web books do have some pros and cons. Uh, the advantages is it's a simple post get request. You know, it's way more efficient than polling. You're not wasting any kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, near, it's more near real time than, than polling. But, you know, uh, there's disadvantages. Uh, there's lost info if your service goes down. If your API is down for some reason or even maintenance, uh, your third party SaaS provider may not be doing the retries that you expect, or they don't do retries, and you can just lose some data. Um, it's internet facing, you know, there's a lot of security you need to do in, you've got to write your custom author, uh, auth, you've got to lock it down for various kind of things. Um, there's often the security model uses static secrets, it's not the best approach, you've got to manage the API, and you know, it can be difficult to scale. There could be many events you don't want to handle, and now your third party is just dumping a huge amount of stuff uh, through your API, and that's going to cost you more money when maybe you don't need to, uh, when maybe you don't need to know about all of those different uh, events. <clears throat> so, question is, uh, can we do better than polling or webhooks? Well, within AWS, what this presentation is about is we've got a fairly new serverless event bus. So hopefully solve directly this. And this is called Amazon EventBridge. And it was announced, I think, just under a year ago at the New York uh, AWS Summit in New York. And it's a serverless events bus. And it really makes events first-class citizens within the AWS world. And what it helps is it helps you ingest and root events from uh, SaaS applications, from AWS services, and your own systems. And although Amazon EventBridge itself is a new uh, application, it's actually evolved from CloudWatch events. So if anybody has used CloudWatch, and CloudWatch events was a part of CloudWatch, which was basically an if this then that for your CloudWatch logs. So it would look at your logs, and do some pattern matching. If it finds something, then uh, kick off a task. Well, they obviously looked at this and went, well, that's a really good idea. We can make this way bigger than, uh, than it can be. And so uh, CloudWatch events has now evolved into Amazon EventBridge. And so, you know, even though it's a new service, it is built for massive, massive scale. Um, you know, literally trillions of events per month are already going, uh, going through the system. So, uh, although a new product, it is already heavily used within AWS and with many customers. So, quickly, I just want to jump on to when I called it a serverless uh, event bus. You know, what does that really mean? So, when we talk about serverless here at AWS, there's some things we like to think about when we define something as serverless. And the first of all is no infrastructure provisioning and no management. And that's really the removal of the undifferentiated heavy lifting that is server operations. There's no infrastructure provision or manage, no physical or virtual servers to look after, to operate, to patch. There are no containers or even clusters that you need to look after yourself. There's no infrastructure to manage in any way, shape, or form. Uh, as a request come in, serverless should automatically scale with your usage. So when you think about elasticity of your application, as more requests come in, it scales up the underlying infrastructure to match that load. And as your load drops, it also scales down. The unit of uh, consumption is often the individual request rather than a whole server unit. And then really nicely uh, correlated to that is you pay for value. You really only pay for what you use. If you use more, you pay more. If you use a little, little bit less, you pay a little bit less. And if you use nothing, the whole cool thing about serverless is the idea that you never pay for idle. And this goes along with the automatic scaling from a cost perspective. You really shouldn't need to think about capacity management in advance. Having to pay for infrastructure upfront. Uh, in a server full environment, pre-provisioning servers to handle peak load, even when you're not fully utilizing them. And then lastly, uh, you know, as importantly, is, is the built-in availability and fault tolerance. Uh, you know, at AWS, we have the concept of regions. Inside regions, we have availability zones, you know, separate data centers inside a larger geo. Um, and one of the architectural best practices is to, is to build apps across multiple availability zones inside a given region. Well, with our serverless products, this is something we do for you. You don't have to think about this. Availability is built into the service. 
with a lot more of the infrastructure managed by AWS, we take on the security of this as well. You still need to secure, obviously, your applications, but yeah, we look after more of the underlying infrastructure security and availability and just a lot more of the stack. So when we talk about serverless, we mean you can focus on the building of your application rather than the management and scaling of the infrastructure to support the application. So AWS Lambda, as you may very well know, is a serverless product that really sits at the center of a few different uh, trends or terms or, or, or things. Um, so AWS Lambda is an example of a serverless FAS product and FAS stands for functions as a service. So uh, you know, AWS Lambda is an example of a, of a functions as a service product, but it sits within the, the bigger event-driven um, compute. And <clears throat> Lambda lets you run code without provisioning or managed services. You only pay it for the compute time you consume, and there's no code, uh, there's no charge when your code is not running. And it's interesting to think um, when Lambda was actually announced uh, at AWS reInvent just over five years ago, there was no concept of serverless. Nothing in the whole presentation was ever about serverless. But what it was, what it did, did talk about was event-driven computing. And so this is why we're here today is to really explain about how serverless really is key for event-driven computing, even though serverless itself doesn't make a huge, uh, a huge bunch of sense, event-driven computing is a, is a certain part. So yeah, Lambda, we all love Lambda, you just upload your code, Lambda takes care of everything required to run and scale your app with high availability built in. And what you can do is you can set your codes automatically trigger from other AWS services or even connect uh, directly from any, uh, any web or mobile app. So Lambda doesn't just sit in a vacuum. It will typically form part of a serverless application, typically with two or three components. There's an event source. Uh, so the event source can be something changes in the data state, so maybe an update to a database. Um, there can be a request to an endpoint, so something hitting your API, or something like a change in a, in a, in a, in a resource state. So, you know, kind of things you can think of it as event sources is an upload to an S3 bucket or a request from an HTTP endpoint. And then that passes the event on to a function. And the function provides a curated execution environment. And um, this execution environment can run in a number of languages. So we've got Node.js, Python, Java, Go, Ruby, and .NET. So they are, they are the built-in runtimes. <clears throat> but literally, you can go and create your own custom runtimes. So I mean, some people have been doing things in PHP and Scala, everything, what else? Rust, uh, even COBOL, you know, Rust, Erlang, Elixir. So people are able to build these custom runtimes with, uh, with Lambda. So it's really a whole bunch of different um, different programming languages which you can use to create these functions and then the functions can do some computing do some something and then what they do is they send it on to a destination and the destination is whatever your code needs to interface with this and this is entirely up to you uh, that depends on your business logic and your requirements and you know it can be an internal aws service or an external service so say you're writing an application that's doing payments for example you may integrate with something like stripe or you are doing um, some authentication, so maybe with Auth0, or maybe, you know, it's super hot in Lebanon today, you've written an application to do some, some weather kind of thing, so you would then connect to an external weather API, for example. So any, any kind of service that you can do. And in Lambda's execution model, there are three different ways we categorize how, how Lambda runs. Uh, there's a synchronous, so this is something about generally behind API Gateway. So somebody hits the slash orders URL, and that kicks off the synchronous Lambda function, which then uh, responds back directly to the client. And the second uh, execution model for Lambda is asynchronous, which is event-based part of what the stuff we're talking about today. So things like uh, Amazon SMS and Amazon S3 and SQS and EventBridge and a whole bunch of different uh, applications are able to uh, put events or send events directly to Lambda based on whatever's happening within the, uh, those services. And the client uh, in this case gets an immediate response as soon as the Lambda service has received it. And then the Lambda service will then go on and process the request and the client doesn't have to wait for the Lambda service, hence it being asynchronous. And uh, the third one is um, stream-based execution model, which is poll-based. So this is where the Lambda service actually polls things like DynamoDB 
and Amazon Kinesis on your behalf, and that can that set at a particular timer, and that finds any changes within DynamoDB or Kinesis, and then that will invoke a Lambda service, which can then look at what those changes are in that time and do something uh, do something based on those on whatever the changes are in it. So some of the notable features of Amazon uh, EventBridge. It's really a fully managed pay-to-go system. There's very little to set up. You don't have to manage your own EC2 instances. You don't have to manage your own uh, queue. You don't have to manage your own polars. You don't have to manage uh, anything. It's got native integration with a number of SaaS providers. Uh, we'll go through some of them later. Uh, 25 plus SaaS providers, and they are people from Alt Sierra to Datadog to Zendex to a whole bunch of numbers. I'll, I'll bring up the web page later and you can, you can have a look and see what you're interested in. Uh, also, there are 90 plus built-in AWS services already as sources. So uh, these can be notifications from, you know, from EC2 to other Lambda functions, to uh, other event bridge, to container workloads, to literally a whole bunch of AWS services, 90 plus of them, and they can be plugged directly in the sources. And then what you can do is you can route Amazon event bridge um, events onto 17 AWS services as a target. And then, you know, just talking about the, the money aspect uh, for a bit, it basically costs you $1 per million events that are put onto the event bus. And then nicely, there's really no additional cost for delivery to other AWS services, and you don't pay for um, receiving events from AWS services. So this can be a very uh, cost-effective way to build up your uh, applications. Traffic also travels internally within the AWS infrastructure, so it's not uh, it's not on the internet, so it's a really secure and good system. So let's have a look at how does it work. Well, on the left hand side, we've got things uh, event sources. So these are sources that can plug into your into EventBridge, and it all starts with an event source, and there uh, and there are three of them. As I've said, AWS services, 90 plus AWS services, which can plug in. Um, there were also uh, custom uh, event sources, and these can be your applications. So your applications can create events which can be put onto uh, an event bus. And then also SaaS applications. So these are the built in 25 plus SaaS partners, which uh, AWS has partner partnered with. And these are the different types of uh, event sources. And for the SaaS applications, there's a, a logical connection between the SaaS partner and your AWS account. And you don't need to send up any cross accounts, IAM roles or credentials. I'll show you what that looks like a, a little bit later. And then within the middle is the actual event bus itself. And there are three different types of event buses. The default event bus, which is where all the AWS services put their um, events. And <clears throat> If you've used CloudWatch events, this is basically the uh, original default event, event bus from CloudWatch events. Um, you can also create your own custom event buses. So you can create as many as you want, or one per application, or decide how you want to slice and dice your event buses. And then for each uh, SaaS partner, there will be a dedicated event bus uh, within your account per SaaS partner. So next bit, we talk about the rules. So you have an event bus and you have rules. And what you can do is associate the rules with your event bus. There's you know, uh, complex rule handling on all the event fields. So uh, for an exact match, um, and that's just not, because SMS, for example, you can do um, uh, if it's sort of some event-based stuff, but that's only on the metadata. With <clears throat> EventBridge, you can literally look at the, the, whole, the whole payload of, of your event, which um, gives you some more flexibility. Um, and yet yeah, we can then directly target 19, uh, uh, 19 different target services. Uh, so one of them being AWS Lambda. Um, sorry, let me just send somebody else. <clears throat> one of them can be AWS, AWS Lambda, uh, Kinesis, um, for doing some more high throughput uh, uh, data transfers, and then AWS Step Functions, which is a really good product for doing uh, workflows and yes, uh, 17 different targets that EventBridge can send it through. So three different things, a source lands up on EventBrush, gets a uh, pattern match to a rule, and then, uh, then gets sent off onto a destination. So um, we've done the rules, uh, so I'm not clicking on the right place. <clears throat> so let's have a look. And uh, let's have a look at what uh, an example event that may land up on event bridge is. <clears throat> now, an example uh, event is uh, is in JSON, and it is a um, it is a 
it's a J JSON and there's quite a strict format for it in, in a good way because it, it means you can parse that information really easy. So we can see here that the source shows where this uh, event has come from. So this has come from a partner event bus, uh, a partner account, for example, the partners example, or one to example.com. And uh, the detail type tells you what kind of event it is. So in this example, it's a ticket that has been created. And then in the detail, you know, it's got a ticket ID here, a department for billing, and then uh, a creator. So what you can do is you, in EventBridge, you can create an example rule. And you can say, for example, I want this rule to match on anything that matches the source. In this example, example.com slash one, two, three. So this rule would fire off every time a, um, every time a uh, event would come from this particular partner. And what can happen is this event also matches because this department, we can see the department is billing and this rule is set up to say, if the rule will match for either billing or fulfillment, um, this will then uh, trigger off the rules. But an example, this uh, doesn't match seeing the rule is ticket created and not ticket resolved. So this would be, uh, this would just be dropped by the rule and it wouldn't be parsed and yeah, uh, job done, no, the rest of the rule parsing uh, would happen. So it's actually quite simple to reason about these events and create these example rules, literally pattern matching within uh, the information that is uh, in JSON. So what you can associate multiple targets, uh, you, there are five targets per rule, and yeah, we talked about the different targets you can do, lambda, kinesis, uh, step functions, and additional uh, targets. And you know these don't have to all be serverless things. Um, you can start the execution of an ECS task or Fargate, or um, you know that's all part of those seventeen different uh, seventeen different targets. So, okay, enough with all the arrows and boxes and PowerPoint. Let's actually uh, see how this really works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look directly at some. We're going to look at directly at some code and see exactly how this works. <clears throat> so, to keep this simple, let's just go back to the uh, original example. We have the order service and we have the invoice service, and we're going to use an event bus between them. So that's going to be event bridge. So it's going to look like this. So we've got uh, the order service now decoupled from the invoice service, an event bus in the middle, and some routing filtering rules to do some magic. So let's look at the code. I was going to bring up VS Code to look at this, and then it was jumping through so many different um, windows. I thought it's actually going to be simpler just to just to write it over here, which is uh, easy to see. So in this example, we've got the order service code on the left hand side. Um, this is a Node.js in the example, and it constructs a parameters object in JSON. And we can see here we had the parameters uh, that we had earlier. We've got the, the order, the, the state being created, an order ID, um, the detail type new order, and uh, the event bus name going onto the uh, event bus. Now, <clears throat> what's nice about this is we can actually put a large amount of, of detail in here. And, uh, you know, you, you can put some pretty big JSON pay payloads within your, uh, within, onto event bus, and so that makes it uh, super useful. Now what's going to happen is the order service is going to send this detail, oh sorry, and at the bottom you can see the event bridge to put events, so that put events is, is the line of code that's literally going to put that event um, JSON onto the event bus, and what's going to happen is event bridge is going to uh, send back a 200 um, if that's going to be all good, and uh, the client is going to receive a new, a unique UUID for the actual event is going to be created, and then the client can carry on processing. So uh, that part uh, becomes a synchronous that the client can carry on. It's got its acknowledgement from event bridge, but then behind the scenes, uh, event bridge can turn into can be in asynchronous mode, and that can then go and in this example uh, invoke the, the invoice service. Now, there's very little in here. This is just an example, but basically the event bus rule is going to match and it's going to hit the invoice service, and it's just going to return a status code 200 in an example. But you know what you would do within this uh, invoice service is actually have your your code over here that that invoice service would do. So. Um, this is the rule defining what would happen. It's written in cloud formation. And for serverless users, you can also use SAM, so the service application uh, model, which allows you to abstract cloud formation. So the key thing to spot here, it's a matching on the event pattern, it's matching on the source being demo.orders and the state being created, and the target is a lambda function. 
So <clears throat> looking back at the order service, it generates an event for a new order. Uh, and so this rule will basically match and then the entire event is passed through. So the invoice service picks up the order ID. Um, but interesting, remember that the order service actually has no idea that this came from the order service. Sorry, the invoice service has no idea this came from the order service. This wasn't clear. The uh, event, uh, event bridge has just routed the order services event onto the invoice services. And so, you know, uh, we talked about the difficulty of adding new services in orchestrated workflows. Well, how would we then handle the reward service with this uh, event bus? Well, it's simple uh, enough as adding another rule. Uh, it's very similar to the last one, but, you know, in this case, the target is different. And by adding this rule, the same event pattern will now trigger a new target, in this case, a reward service. And if we wanted the reward service to be triggered by a different event, we would just simply change the event pattern. There's no change to the order service, no changes to the invoice service, and this makes it really simple to add additional functionality. So recently, the EventBridge schema registry was launched, which allows you to discover, create, and manage open API schemas for events on EventBridge. So that JSON object we were seeing from the order service, you know, this can get a bit complicated between uh, different microservices. If you've got different teams that are putting events onto your event bus, um, you've got to now have some coordination with these teams to try and work out who is who, what's the structure of the JSON format, and you know, it can become complicated. So um, what uh, Amazon Event Bridge Schema Registry does is, it, first of all, it's a registry for existing AWS services. So you can create and also upload uh, custom schemas or you can generate schemas based on events on an event bus. So um, what you can do is you can, AWS events have a, a strong typed uh, event type and you can grab those from a schema registry and use them directly into your code. Uh, super nice, there are direct integrations for uh, Visual Studio Code and JetBrains. And I said they were strongly typed, so you know, this is good for languages like Java, Python, and TypeScript. And really allows you to use the, the, the schema information directly within your code. And in fact, I've got a demo of that uh, in a little while. Um, <clears throat> so, Oh, on the wrong slide. So some common event bridge use cases. Uh, we'll just uh, flick through a few of these. So, you know, you have an AWS service that you want something to take action on. And so what you can do is you have any AWS services which uh, puts a message on AWS uh, on the default event bus. With event bridge, uh, Lambda uh, rule will match with that. AWS Lambda pick that, picks that up, takes some action on that and does whatever. Talks to your internal systems, talks to a third party, does whatever. Uh, another example is there is an application event. So this isn't an AWS event, but your application has generated an event which uh, um, gets uh, put onto Amazon Event Bridge, and that may directly kick off an AWS step function workflow, for example, which can do some whole orchestrated coordinated um, thing based on what you need to do. Um, there are other examples here. So like this is, say, uh, applying some intelligence, which we'll actually look at an example shortly. And we've got a SaaS application via Zendesk. Uh, that's going to directly put uh, events on your event bridge. Uh, Lambda's going to pick them up, and then it's going to use some other AWS services, such as SageMaker or Comprehend, to do some analysis on whatever that Zendesk uh, ticket that, you, that, that was created, and really helps you to connect these third-party applications together. Um, you can also uh, have an application event that you then can pump through to something like Kinesis Data Firehose, which could be pumped something into S3, and then you, you could use a theme to query that. So, you know, you may want to have a central place to dump all your application uh, information. This is a good workflow that you could uh, quite simply create. And last example, uh, Datadog is another SaaS application. And what you can do is Datadog can then uh, put things directly on Amazon Event Bridge and a Lambda function can then pick that up. And maybe because Datadog is obviously to do with monitoring, uh, that Lambda service may then put some metadata into DynamoDB and then maybe um, send information back to Datadog to do some other processing. So you can synchronize your data between an external system and an internal system. So onboarding a SaaS event source with EventBridge is actually really, really easy. We'll have a quick look at that shortly. You basically register your AWS account ID with the SaaS partner. All the SaaS partners are sort of slightly uh, different, you know, the 25 plus uh, and growing. Um, <clears throat> and what this will do is once you've done that, it'll create a partner event source, 
which will then appear in your account. And then you go into your AWS account and then you can activate that. And what that means is you associate the event source uh, with the event bus. And in this example, you can see the partner example.com123, but you know, if it was Datadog or Zendesk or Auth0, you would actually see uh, that name within the partner event source uh, as a third party uh, provider. So then we would create some rules and those rules would uh, talk to the event, uh, look at, watch what's happening on the event bus and they would JSON match the attributes and the parameters and then send that event onto another target. In this example, it shows uh, Lambda and uh, SQS for diff two different rules, but remember there are 17 different built-in targets for that. So let's have a quick bit of a demo, which is going to sort of jump through quite a few different things at the same time. And I, uh, I hope we're gonna all be able to do it, or all be able to, <clears throat> all be able to follow. Because uh, yeah, there are a lot of nice, exciting uh, moving pieces. But this example is a website where a user writes a review. So you know, it's, uh, in this example, it's a t-shirt company um, called Encrypt Everything T-shirt. And uh, you want your customers to be able to write, rev write reviews that are good or, good or bad. <clears throat> Those reviews are stored in an external MongoDB Atlas database. And MongoDB is one of our SaaS partners. So what's going to happen is MongoDB, when anything new is written to the MongoDB database, that's going to automatically put something on Amazon EventBridge. And Lambda is going to see that that uh, database update record has landed on Amazon EventBridge. And what that's going to do is that's going to then uh, invoke Amazon Comprehend. So Amazon Comprehend is going is a, a machine learning service, and that is going to be able to basically read that review that's coming from MongoDB and do some analysis on it to see whether it is a positive or a negative review. And then if this is a negative review, what's going to happen is it's going to then send it on to Zendesk, uh, which is a, a ticketing system. So you are aware that you have a negative review based on one of the products on your website. So it's just an example, but it's hard to see that you can integrate all these different, uh, all these different uh, services using EventBridge to connect to a third party, using an internal Amazon service to do some machine learning, and then uh, using also Lambda to pass that information onto your to your ticketing system. So I'm just going to flick over. Um, I was going to if I was going to show this whole thing without a, a video. There are so different mo many moving parts that uh, something would definitely go wrong. So apologies for having to use a video, but I think it's going to be good enough for our um, our sanity for everybody to make sure that this is all works. So <clears throat> uh, this is my T-shirt store. I am a vendor and I sell some uh, lovely t-shirts and we can see here that you've got a review system at the bottom and you know a number of people have written reviews and I could go in and write some reviews and these reviews are stored in the MongoDB um, Atlas which is a um, external database service. <clears throat> so to connect up MongoDB up to Amazon EventBridge I would sign into my external MongoDB account. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go into the triggers and I'm gonna add a trigger. And what I'm gonna say is, well, I've got a trigger that's, um, that's my database details. And I'm gonna say whenever there's an insert and an update going onto my, within my MongoDB. So you know, in, in effect, when somebody uploads a review, it's gonna be an insert or an update onto the database table. <coughs> and I want that to kick off something with EventBridge. I want the full document to be sent to EventBridge. And here I simply put in my AWS account ID and select the, the, the region. And that's it. From That's all I've had to do from the partner side to um, connect it up. So then I go immediately afterwards directly into my AWS account. I look at EventBridge and I can see that my MongoDB partner has already been created as a partner event source. And all I do is I simply select on that and I associate it with a particular event bus, which then gets created and literally job done. I then go and look at my event buses and I have now connected my partner MongoDB with my customer event bus internally. I haven't had to set up uh, doing any polling. I haven't had to set up any webhooks. I haven't had to set up any crazy IAM permissions to allow this to happen. Um, yeah, look how simple it was to integrate these two. So what I can then do is I can then go into the, uh, then I can go, where's my video going? 
what I can do is then I can go into my um, custom event bus and now I'm going to have just a look, for example, at this uh, schema discoveries part. So I'm building an application. Uh, I know MongoDB is going to be putting some events, but I really don't know the structure of those events. I don't know what they're going to look like. Um, so I want to find that out. So what I do is I simply just uh, click the start discovery. And what that's going to do, I then, you know, this generally what you do is you do this on your dev environment. So you would, uh, because obviously you, you're not just going to power this on, on, on a production environment. So on my dev environment, I've got MongoDB fired up. <clears throat> I then do a, a dev review, uh, uh, you know, a, a test review for my application. And I see if that uh, with the schema discovery is on. This is all the schemas. So here you can see there are a whole bunch of different uh, AWS schemas. I can then go into the discovered part of the schema registry and um, uh, MongoDB has already put something on the event bus and I can simply go in and go, look, here is the whole JSON object of what a MongoDB um, document would look like when I uh, put it into event bus, uh, when, I, when I'm going to put it into event bus. But then even more cool is you can directly connect this up to your um, editor, your code editor of choice. So VS Code uh, or VS Code, I'm using IntelliJ over here, um, the Python one as well. So literally I've got uh, IntelliJ connected up to my AWS account <clears throat> and within the AWS Explorer, which is part of the AWS toolkit, which comes in flavors for these various different, uh, uh, for these various um, uh, client IDs. I can go and look directly at all the schemas that are generated for all AWS events and then look at the discovered schemas. And there we go, I have MongoDB and I can go and view the schema directly within my IDE. So remember the schema has come through, uh, I'm now to build it. Uh, the event bridge has just been watching the event bus, has spotted the new schema that's uh, come along and off I go. So what I can then do is that I know now my schema, what I can do is actually, I can just go and build a project directly within my IDE. So what is cool over here, if you haven't seen this, is I can use AWS service application and I can build a service application directly from my IDE. I'm not doing the console. I'm not having to do <clears throat> you know, anything uh, funny outside my normal development environment. And also I can go and I can go and build a service application. It's strongly typed, so I'm gonna select the uh, Java and then uh, the sound template, I'm going to have a sound template that is uh, for based on an event bridge app triggered by the scheme registry. And right within here, I can go down, there's obviously all the AWS events as well. And then down I go, and I can then see there's my MongoDB uh, event schema, which I had previously discovered. <clears throat> and then if I go and navigate within my um, application that's been built, I can see the class that has been created. I've got a header world app, and there we go. I've got the whole object uh, which has come through and it's already been, uh, inserted into code, which I could use here, or I can copy it into some other parts of, uh, of my code. So this is literally the code to handle the event that would come through um, from EventBridge. So what I would do here in this example, here's just a, is do the strongly typed. So you can see the strongly typed language. I can look at the get full document and I can look at the customer information, for example, and literally within my ID, I'm, I'm able to use Hyperhead to look at the exact schema that came through for the customer event bus from um, MongoDB. Makes it really simple for developers to be able to uh, use these events within their applications. So um, once we've got the, the name of the, the customer name, which is something we're gonna, we want to also pass through. And then here's a little bit of uh, um, Lambda code that's gonna basically talk to comprehend. And this is basically gonna say, well, <clears throat> if after the talk to comprehend, it's going to say, well, if this is a negative review, then I want to send it on to Zendesk. And so, you know, obviously this is a bit of a contrived example. Uh, what I want to, what I want to do is I want to take that. If, if it's a negative review, I'm going to send it on to, I'm going to send it on to um, Zendesk. So here we can deploy the service application. And because this is all based on a uh, service application model and it's based on CloudFormation, you'll be familiar with CloudFormation stacks. I can go and create a stack. I can choose an S3 bucket where it's going to be um, <clears throat> uploaded to. And I literally go and deploy my service uh, application and off it goes and it builds. And it's literally uh, 
can be as, uh, as simple as that. So if I then go into my <clears throat> uh, Zendesk, for example, you can see I have no unsolved tickets. So this is at the end of the queue. I've got no unsolved uh, tickets in my group. Um, I am then um, go back onto my uh, uh, my store and I, I am John's pretending to be John Smith and I give a one star review for this particular t-shirt and you know this is basically going to be a, a negative review and say it's poor quality and I go and submit my review. So off I go, what's going to happen? This is going to update a record in MongoDB. MongoDB is going to talk to Amazon EventBridge. Amazon EventBridge is going to do the machine learning analysis and send my negative review directly onto Zendesk. So there we go. I could then create some workflow, which then grab this negative review and do uh, and do something with it. So that's basically the example, which hopefully covers you know, quite a few. Whoops, let's try and jump to the right thing, which uh, covers quite a few, um, uh, which uh, <clears throat> covers quite a few different parts of the application, and so. You can see the whole order service um, is uh, decoupled from <clears throat> decoupled from all the different services, and using Amazon EventBridge into the into the middle allows you to uh, coordinate with so many more services, and your services can both produce messages onto the bus and also consume just the messages they need, and the services don't need to know uh, about each other, just about the bus. Um, I've just got some different information here as well, and then I'll take some questions about uh, Amazon EventBridge versus SNS, for example. <clears throat> so often there's a lot of talk about what the differences are. Well, you know, EventBridge re uh, connects really well to uh, many more AWS services, um, has the uh, SaaS integrations and custom applications, uh, while SNS only talks to 30 AWS services and as well with custom applications. So EventBridge has the SaaS partners. Um, uh, SNS, you can only target uh, far fewer um, destinations. And um, one of the things where SNS is, is probably more scalable than EventBridge is there are many millions of subscribers to, to, to a topic. So if you want me to send out events to you know, literally millions of other places, well, uh, SNS is gonna be your friend, but you know, um, Amazon EventBridge is able to, uh, able to send uh, between 400 and 2400 events per uh, second. This is actually a soft limit, and we've got customers who are running into the many hundreds of thousands. So um, um, the filtering, that, that's something I mentioned before, EventBridge can do the whole payload, while SNS can only do the message attributes. SNS is a little quicker, you know, for the latency. Um, I know the EventBridge team is working hard on that, but if latency is a super important for you, thing for you at the moment, um, then uh, SNS may be something you want to look at. And then just from a, a pricing perspective, uh, EventBridge is $1 per million for custom or SaaS events, but remember it's free for any, any AWS events. And you know, SNS is half that price for a topic, um, but remember that um, often SNS you land up wiring it in with uh, SQS ex as an example, we haven't covered that, but uh, to have a queuing mechanism within your, uh, on the back of your SNS. And so, the, that story may not be entirely true. So yeah, uh, price is something certainly to consider. Um, comparing with just some other things, we've said it's the uh, CloudWatch events, uh, it's a replacement for that. SNS is super good for high throughput. Kinesis is really good for real-time processing, um, you know, but it, you can only have limited consumers for stream. It's not entirely serverless, so Kinesis, um, you need to scale it, you need to create your shards and manage your shards yourself, and, the, uh, and you pay for that per shard hours. So um, it's not entirely serverless from a pricing perspective. And then SQS is really great as a queue if you need resiliency and you need guarantees um, with, a, with a recently launched FIFA queues and you need to buffer your downstream resources. And you know, with, with SQS, there's no, there's no filtering and there's no ordering for uh, the standard queues. So quickly, just to wrap up, we've covered you know, a few of the common challenges in managing complex microservices for private applications and across third party systems. Um, you know, decoupling APIs and webhooks mechanisms tend to lock you uh, into a more rigid monolithic state, even in separate services. And event bus can help keep these services decoupled even as your systems become more complex and with certainly new versions of services. Uh, simplified event routing, the happy path works well, but handling error states can get really difficult to orchestrate and, and, and manage. And an event bus can help manage errors across complex workflows. 
and ensure services remain simple. Uh, you know, they're only listening to the events they care about and only being responsible for creating events. Um, really good way to improve availability. Uh, for a synchronous API, the availability of the entire system can be impacted by the failure of any single service within the chain. So moving towards an asynchronous infrastructure based around events allows more resilience and with the right architecture design can also improve, improve your availability. Uh, the third part, the integration is really good. We saw how WebOx are better than polling, but also come with their own challenges. And event a bridge offers SaaS integrations with a growing number of partners that can treat new data in these systems as events. And then finally, we looked at some code examples to show you exactly how the events are constructed. Uh, within the demo, we popped into um, an IDE to sort of show how the schema registry was done and how you could literally use the code bindings directly within your uh, application and how you could link, uh, you know, in the example, MongoDB all the way through to um, uh, Zendesk. So I mean, I'm super excited about EventBridge. I think it's really going to become the basis of so many applications. Um, it's really easy to understand. It's really easy to create rules. And you know, I really believe that events can make uh, many complex architectures much more um, resilient and certainly easier to maintain. So yeah, <clears throat> I'm super, super thankful that you could join me today. Um, as I said, I'm Julian Wood. I'm happy for you to uh, get in touch with me on Twitter. Um, or you can email me directly at jrwood at uh, amazon.com. And so, yeah, I'm going to just jump into the chat and see if we've got any questions and see how we're doing. Yes, uh, Julian, thank you so much. We have Peter here. He says, uh, why do we need the vent bridge between the app and Kinesis Firehose? Why we don't use Kinesis Stream instead? Yeah, I think the answer to that is, uh, is uh, it depends if... Um, if EventBridge is going to be routing to a number of different services and Kinesis, uh, Kinesis Stream is only, and, and Kinesis is going to be only one of the endpoints, <clears throat> then that's where that scalability is going to be, where um, EventBridge is going to be able to send maybe things to another Lambda function or to an EventBridge in another account or to SNS or to SQS or something like that. So it just creates that, uh, that um, uh, that coupling. Um, the Kinesis stream is going to be super good for uh, high throughput workloads. You then would set up Lambda functions that would look at those uh, individual streams, but you can't then have different, um, different things looking at those individual streams and then doing different things on that, if that makes sense. So <clears throat> yet maybe you don't actually need to have, uh, in some examples, you certainly don't always need to have a vent bridge over there, but it does give you the, uh, the future flexibility. And um, if uh, you guys have any other questions, just raise your hand or uh, unmute. Uh, also, if we can have like a, like a Zoom selfie, you know, like if we put out our, uh, if you turn on our video cameras. Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah. Hello. So first of all, thank you, Julian, for the informative uh, webinar. It was really informative. Uh, if you could go back to the slide um, with the J when you were showing the JSON rules and the event bridge. Let me find that. It's the JSON rules. <clears throat> Which one? Because I think that's, I did that twice. Uh, uh, could you put it on the screen? Because I cannot see it. Is that is that the one? Oh, that's that's more the cloud formation one. Um, let me look at I that think here. it was before that. Yeah, uh, there we go. <clears throat> yeah, this this one. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I I want to ask about the structure of the JSON, like when you you want when you want to match on department, for example, you have to abide by the structure of the J, uh, the JSON coming from the example event. So it's it was more of a yeah. technical question, to see like what would happen in the case if we had the department as a JSON key above the outside the, the JSON object. So I just wanted to make sure that we have to abide by the JSON yeah, so, structure. Um, EventBridge does have a strict, well not strict, but it has a set format that things need to arrive at. Each um, example event needs to have a source field, needs to have a detail type field, and then the detail is more free flowing. So within the detail, you could have as many fields as you want in there. Yeah. But yeah, okay. there needs to be a detail dash type and there needs to be a source field. Okay, thank you. 
uh, so also the event bridge would only accept something onto the event bus if that matches otherwise it'll error yeah great okay uh, also another question um regarding uh, like use cases event bridge you said like you can directly call it from from an api call uh, there was a slide where you showed different use cases so for the first use case there um i don't know if i under understood it wrong or correct but can isn't it similar to what api gateway could be used for for, for example api gateway you can forward certain api for apis to it and then it could trigger certain um, AWS services depending on the uh, like request body or the URL itself and stuff like this. So what's the difference between, I, I understand that event bus could handle all the different services, but a part of it, can't it be handled from API gateway? Like it's similar? Yes, yeah, certainly. So I would, my thinking would be that API gateway is a really good use case for um, synchronous calls. So uh, you know, you've got a website or an API where someone makes a, a call and they need to get a response uh, immediately. Now, there are many ways to slice and dice this. For example, you can have a direct service integration from API gateway to EventBridge. So you could, for example, if you were to build your own webhook, so you have a, an application that you're building and you want to build a webhook, you could use API gateway to host that API and you can use uh, VTL, which is a velocity template language within API gateway to literally directly send events onto uh, Amazon event bridge. You could also uh, have API gateway with a Lambda function. So a Lambda function can also then take that synchronous request and then put something onto event bridge if you want to do it that way. But the, I think the, the key thing to think about is to understand what your synchronous requests are and understand what your asynchronous requests are. And ultimately you don't want your client waiting for something to happen on the back end where they don't really need to be waiting. So yeah, there are different, different uh, applications you can use. Um, certainly if you need to write, uh, manage an API, API great gateway is a, uh, a great use case for that. But sometimes you don't really need to manage your API directly and you could put messages that either directly on event bridge or you could put messages directly on an SQS queue on an SMS topic or with Kinesis. Um, so yeah, have a think about whether you actually do need to uh, do need to manage your own API. But yeah, as your example, you said, looking at the event uh, at, at the body of, uh, you know, a put event, uh, sorry, a put request within a within API gateway. Yeah, that may be a use case. Thank you. Something I just wanted to put, put up is, we, is a, if you look on the AWS Compute blog and you, uh, you, can, you can also search for uh, Amazon Event Bridge, there are really a whole bunch of really excellent, uh, so I'm just gonna open these tabs because they've all gone, uh, gone to hibernate, but there are really a whole bunch of good blog posts that um, other people within my uh, team and myself have done. And so uh, there's a whole series that uh, James Bezik who's, who's on my team and he's done a whole series of wiring up uh, Amazon S3 to EventBridge. Uh, there's connecting EventBridge and Zendesk, uh, deep coupling larger applications with EventBridge, which I'll actually have a quick look at. <coughs> um, which is really good, which um, I'm not that one. But basically, if you look on the AWS Compute blog, you look at uh, search for EventBridge, and there's so many examples over here which have, you know, SAM templates and examples of rules and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of kind of things. So here's an example, you know, Zendesk being an external partner, how everything's going to go through and sending it to different Lambda functions and step functions. Um, which one is this? This is a really good use case where we see uh, which is going to be really interesting for EventBridge. So if we have an example here of um, something's put in an S3 bucket and you need to, a whole bunch of Lambda functions would pull things off and then send it to various different kind of things. This turns into a whole, you can just see by the picture, it looks like a bit of a difficult application. So what with EventBridge is you could literally split this application into five different completely separate applications uh, with different Lambda functions that literally just look at Amazon EventBridge Amazon Event Bridge is connected to S3, so things get dumped and redumped onto S3 as they as they evolve through the application, and the different functions just pull off um, different things off S3 buckets and can do their little bit of workflow and then dump it back onto Event Bridge, pointing to another S3 bucket. And that's a so yeah, this is a really nice uh, use case to see the bigger picture of how you can use uh, Event Bridge to split up your uh, your applications. So that's on the compute blog. Um, James is, oh, let me 
I will stick that in the chat because then you can also see over there. Uh, James's use cases, because he's actually got a GitHub repository which has them over there. So you can actually go and see the code. Um, there's yeah, another example over here, which is also from the compute log, which is Auth0, which is a, a authentication third party provider and how you can do some clever stuff with that. Um, so that's so advanced rules, so there are a whole bunch of advanced rules you can you can do. So when we were you were talking about the pattern matching, they don't just need to be exact, but now you can do uh, you know um, numeric ranges exists you know begins with ends with all these different kind of things. So you can write uh, create some more uh, certainly more complex rules, and also. Uh, James as well did this um, learning path. So this is literally uh, an introduction and a whole seven different videos going through all the different aspects of Event Bridge. So we've covered a lot of them in the talk today, but if you want to take some time and delve into them a little bit detail, a little bit more detail, um, that's yeah, that's really a um, that's really a good uh, example. A uh, whole bunch of examples, and then yeah. Talking about the third-party examples, I'm just going to flick through the screen here, but I mean, you can see Datadog and Epsilon and Freshworks and Cloudless and MongoDB, which we covered, New Relic, Upstream, New Pager Duty, Signal Effects, Semantic Tundra, Whisper, Zendesk. So, and these are just increasing all the time. So, you know, a lot of third uh, SaaS partners are really excited about integrating with the uh, Event Bridge, and yeah, more and more are coming. So, stay tuned. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? There's uh, another question from uh, Danny. He says, what if we had hundreds of events coming together simultaneously? How are the orders of the events sent to their subscribers? Uh, yeah, so first of all, hundreds of events coming together simultaneously from a um, throughput perspective, <clears throat> uh, that is not a problem. Um, yeah, the ordering of the events is something that you are going to need to handle within your application. Uh, uh, EventBridge doesn't have uh, strict ordering. So uh, for an example, if you, um, if you had uh, something that you needed strict ordering, you're going to need to handle that elsewhere, either within something like step functions from an orchestration point of view, or just be able to uh, uh, pick up something off an event bus. And if something else hasn't happened, then um, <clears throat> you could send it off into a queue to wait, or you could do it, some different kind of things. But the, the bigger point is that um, EventBridge doesn't have a strict ordering. And so you will need to manage the ordering of events elsewhere um, in your application. Uh, okay, any other uh, questions? This link doesn't... Oh, the link doesn't lead anywhere. That's strange. I'm using the power of copy and paste. Um, <laughs> how bizarre. Uh, unless it's an internal URL. All right, it looks like it's working. Well, if not, you can. Um, um, I'll share the I'll share the links later in a communication over meetup.com with the recording for the session. Yeah, I mean you could also do Google search event bridge learning path. I think that's literally the Google search I did. So <laughs> hopefully the Google food will be able to get it for you. All right, so if uh, search, if, uh, Julian, you're, you're sending it privately to me. Oh, sorry, it's not in there. All right, guys, thank you so much. I think uh, uh, we, we had Julian uh, for, uh, for a good uh, talk. Thank you so much. Uh, hope we can uh, see you again in Beirut soon. And, uh, uh, you can reach out to Julian over Twitter and email, as he said, uh, for uh, for any questions you have about event bridge or event driven architecture. My pleasure. I really enjoyed um, yeah having the chance to speak to you today. Um, yeah, we love event bridge. Um, there's so much going on. It's really helping with um, yeah with a whole bunch of different applications. So I'm just going to uh, pull up. Topics stream. In, this, this was the this was the URL. This uh, this was the webinar I did recently, which was all talking about the difference between um, EventBridge, SNS, SQS, and Kinesis. Let me just check if I've got the right video. That is me. So 
So yeah, if you want to get into more detail specifically with uh, SNS, EventBridge, SQS, Kinesis, what's the difference? And this has also got a lot of detail deep down on how Lambda works, uh, Lambda concurrency, how you can um, architect your service applications so they're super resilient and super available. Um, yeah, that's also a good webinar to, to have a look at. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Uh, guys, any more questions? Anybody would like to uh, jump in? All right, I guess this is it. Uh, thanks. So we'll meet again in a few weeks. Absolutely. Hopefully it cools down for you, uh, for you people over the next few days. <clears throat> so you can have a bit of a rest bite so you, you can't swim in the sea of the pools. So, yeah. yeah. Wishing you the best of luck through the, these uh, challenging times. And yeah, have fun with the service and AWS.